Good afternoon, everyone. It's yet another beautiful day in the universe, and we have with us great speakers, great thinkers, great minds, leaders who are going to talk about a subject which should be close to everybody's heart. I'm Anshu Khanna. I'm a columnist, author, and a big supporter of Furo. I have to start by applauding Rachna for what she's doing and always relentlessly getting great minds like we have today to talk about a subject called peace, political peace. So I'll start, we have three speakers today of great repute. I will start with uh, Dr. Deva Priya Bhattacharya. He's a macroeconomist and public policy analyst, a distinguished fellow at the Center for Pol Policy Dialogue, Dhaka, where he was the, its first executive director. He's been a former ambassador and permanent representative of Bangladesh to WTO and UN offices in Geneva and Vienna. President of UNCTAD, Governing Board Special Advisor on LCD to the Secretary General of UNCTAD. Currently, he is number, a member of the United Nations Committee for Development Policy. He has held a number of short-term visiting positions, including at the UN University Institute of New Technology, Institute of Developing Economics, Tokyo, and the University of I Strathclyde, uh, Glasgow. Dr. Bhattacharya has undertaken joint research amongst others with Harvard Business School, University of Manchester, Overseas Development Institute, London, and a large number of research organizations from South Asia. Dr. Bhattacharya is the founding chair of the Southern Voice International Network of Think Tanks, a network of more than 50 think tanks from Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Under the auspices of Southern Voice, he led the pioneering multi-country studies on shaping the 2030 agenda, data deficits of SDG monitoring, and early signals of SDG implementation. He conceptualized the project and led the research team for the first Southern Voice report on the state of SDG. I'm really, really happy to have you here. He chairs the LDC4 Monitor and Alliance Development Organization, including OECD Development Center and the Commonwealth Secretariat, leading to a number of global studies focused on impact of COVID-19 on LDCs and incentives for graduating LDCs. He has contributed to a number of studies in this area conducted by the WTO, UNESCAP, and the Commonwealth Secretariat. As a civil society analyst, he founded the convener of the Citizens Platform for the SDGs Bangladesh, network of about 150 development organizations and private sector bodies, at last but not the least, he is the media personality in Bangladesh and a commentator on international media. Welcome to the forum, Dr. Bhattacharya. It's a pleasure to have you here. My first question to you is India and Bangladesh are possibly uh, big trade partners. As an economist, you'll agree that uh, money and trade can lead to peace and development. Yet we are very, very uh, restrictive about opening our borders. Do you think it's important that we open our borders and allow people from both sides to interact with each other and get to know each other's culture and maybe that will help bond better for the countries? Well, thank you. Um, let me first uh, thank uh, Puro Foundation uh, Innovations for inviting me. I think they are doing a, a splendid job by talking about you know, peace and politics and the regional issues. These are all very pertinent as we, and uh, the issue of political dialogue, the relevance of it as we speak, we, 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 the world is witnessing the high voltage tension in the Ukraine-Russian border and the, the global leaders are trying to find peace through dialogues, not through, uh, you know, violent means at this moment. And regarding opening up the border, uh, you know, Bangladesh has opened up border and given 1 million Myanmar's refugee, refugee status in, in our uh, forcibly displaced people in our country. So it is very peculiar that we have opened up the borders on certain circumstances. I myself had taken advantage of open border in 1971 to be a refugee in India during our liberation war. So, you know, our borders do open up for humanitarian reason as and when it is necessary uh, under compulsion and we have been uh, responsive to that. I will come to the Indo-Bangla relationship a bit later, but let me address the substance of our today's discussion for that matter. I have heard very attentively to Ms. Sharma's uh, initial uh, intervention where she spoke about the positive peace. I was a yes. bit surprised why didn't she talk about just peace? You know, we, we are used to the word just peace. 
not the so-called positive piece. I'm sorry about using the word so-called because many people put in different types of things over there and I prefer the term just speech. Yes. And uh, Bangladesh went to just war. Peace. Just, peace. just, just peace. peace. Just peace. Just peace. Just peace. Uh, we went to, because you know, all peace is not just uh, you can have right. peace and you may still yeah. undermine mm -hmm. the rights of the people and create yeah. that kind of circumstances. So I contest very friendly. No, I uh, accept totally that, because I uh, the positive uh, peace. Yeah, all the uh, research peace. that I've come across so far is Western and all of them, they use a lot of positive peace. And yeah. just peace is, could be the South Asian research. That's what I'm looking for. See, I am looking for these things which possibly I haven't reached up a common person, a normal citizen. We don't understand. If you if you ask anyone what is world peace, they wouldn't understand. They would ask me, what are you trying no, to do? They, they would it? understand yeah. what is just peace. Because the, yeah. a, 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 yeah. hooligan in the, a hooligan in the locality can impose peace as well by, uh, by putting, putting everybody back home uh, before, <laughs> uh, before the evening. And they can also, that can be a peace as well. Uh, yeah. A totalitarian states do put in peace, build peace, but that is also not just in the sense that uh, human rights are not being observed over there. So that's why my, my approach over there is a bit different because uh, lexicon matters. Uh, although we put in different types of contents in the same lexicon or the same vocabulary. But leaving aside that one, coming back to your more fundamental issue uh, on the uh, as dialogue, uh, political peace and etc. Uh, my great grandmother, uh, before she passed away, told me, great grandmother, that son, look at that. When you are invited by Furo Innovations, don't make that more than three points. They are not going to remember the fourth one you are going to say. So let me make my three points over here. Uh, my grandmother's three points. Now, my first point is that, you know, if you don't have uh, just peace within your own country, you cannot have it in cross border relationships. So, so before looking outside, please look inside. I think this is the fundamental point. I, I'm uh, my first one, and if within the within the within the country, there is no respect for human rights, there is no respect for evidence-based discussion, there is no space for public reasoning, there is no space for pluralism and tolerance to alternative views and dissent. And there is no opportunity to solve social conflicts or political conflicts through peaceful means and in a transparent and accountable fashion. Let us not expect peace across the border when we do over there, because the external policy is an expansion or in, in a, you know, a, uh, either vertical or horizontal expansion of your internal policy. The means you use to deal with your own citizens is the, exactly the means you will be using in dealing with other parties across the border. So if you look at SART, if it has become dysfunctional, it's one of the reasons is that we have lost democratic quality within our respective countries. And that is my fundamental point in this case. So that will be the, the issue that to the CERC leaders, look at yourself, don't try to criticize others. And from practical reality, SARC is de facto in comatose, if not dead. Because it is, it, it is the ultimate victim of Indo-Pakistan relationship. If Indo-Pakistan relationship does not get buoyed up through some other uh, different means, then obviously SARC as a structure is de facto done with. And the Islamabad summit is, no, is not going to take place even virtually. The second point uh, uh, which, is, which comes along is that the framework and how do you do go about it in that you know, and also I will bring in the SARC issue over here. The, the framework on, on the basis of which the shared value, the shared principles on the basis of which one should go about is that, uh, is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Un mm -hmm. Universal Declaration of Human Rights Charter provides space and voice to almost all stakeholder in multi-stakeholder approach in, in multinational, multi-ethnic, multi-religious circumstances. And we should be you know, respectful towards that. And that should be the benchmark on which everything else will be done. If you look at the constitutions of each of our countries, they in principle, at least rhetorically, preaches its allegiance to universal human rights. And we should really live up to our 
you know, declarations and what our forefathers have promised to deliver. So that should be one of the benchmarks for me, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The, and United Nations is the right place for that, although we have structural issues in the Security Council and et cetera elsewhere. The new power balance has not been reflected in the governance of the United Nations. We are aware of that. Nonetheless, it is the at least the best we have at this moment over here. Uh, the G20s and others which, are sp which sprung up here and there doesn't have that universal legitimacy which is there with the United Nations even after everything said and done. The other benchmark for me is that the new development consensus which we have is the sustainable development goals. The 2030 agenda of the United Nations, 2015 to 2030, is possibly which is a good framework for all countries to follow and also for regional cooperation and regional development with the commitment that no one will be left behind. If we go you apply that particular framework, then I would say no country will be left behind in the region. Not only no one, but no country should be left behind. So I would think that if in the future, if you want to re regenerate the South Asian spirit of cooperation, then the say, sustainable development goals provide us a handy mechanism. In fact, in the post-COVID circumstances, in the post-pandemic circumstances, this is possibly the most usable, serviceable, you know, the principles on which we can rebuild our relationship, whether it is about vaccination, uh, accessing vaccines, whether it is accessing health support, whether it is medicines and everything else, apart from other emergency health and building on trade investment and other issues over here. Uh, my last point, uh, you know, the third point, which I you wanted to talk about in the Bangla relationship. And I wanted to start off by saying that you, all of you, um, and I sometimes as well, go on telling we have a shared history, uh, culture, et cetera, et cetera. We quite often really, um, you know, I think romanticize the past. And we always quite often, uh, you know, try to create a mythical uh, shared values and other things over their culture and etc. I I I I I am not quite sure that for South Asia, past is an asset. It may become baggage. I think the asset is our shared future. Future is where we should really focus on, because in this globalized and a uh, world, uh, we if we look at the geopolitics and if you look at the re bilateral relationship, everything else will will unpack itself. If you look at how the technology is uh, coming up, how the technological solutions are breaking barriers, which was unthinkable till the other day, as we speak on this uh, you know, virtual world at this moment with all of you over here. And, and it is a creating a totally new world, which, is, which was not perceived by the, our forefathers in many ways over there. This is where the paradigmatic change has to come with the fourth industrial revolution you know, haunting us out there uh, in our perspectives over there. So my point is that then who is going to take this leadership and who is going to do all these things? So if uh, my, in my internal uh, piece, which I'm talking about an internal uh, you know, respect to human rights and other issues, so it is not only that you need to, we need to look at more respectfully towards our indigenous communities, Dalits, not only to our religious minorities in our respective countries, not only stop violence against women over there, but I would also add that we, we need to more carefully or respectfully, caringly look at our youth community. At this moment, if you look at the countries, the educated youth, the new emerging middle class, is possibly one of the most neglected sector. It is not the elites of the country. It is not the poorest of the poor who are under your social safety nets and looked after by different jojnas and other things over there. It is the emerging middle class. It is the educated young people who are really feeling frustrated and feeling despondent and mental stress is very high and unemployment rate is much more higher among them then from a general, a general average youth unemployment, which means the more you get educated, the higher is the propensity or the possibility of remaining unemployed or underemployed in certain ways. So my whole you know, aspiration is, is to bring, look at this new young community, a youth who are much more smarter than us. They are much more globalized than us. 
much more outward looking than us they would and they were possibly more human and more has shared values would be the future leader and would come and build this new south asia and the new world over there that is where i would like to end thank you for giving me the opportunity right i really like this last point uh, of the youth go ahead go ahead yes, no um so i think we've actually not been able to uh, we i don't think we we'll be able to question you on anything because your what your grandmother said is like wisdom all enrolled into one and you almost answered all our questions and i totally resonate with what you're saying about looking in words about uh, shared history and then at the same time uh, peace and uh, uh, tolerance in, internally and the youth so we have a young girl rachna who should actually take over now because i agree with you i i don't know about your country but india saw the youth supporting oh the entire the, you know coming forward during covid and actually you know turning into masiyas you know to save all of us who were stuck with covid at home with nothing to uh, support us with but having said that who have been cynical about sark and the collapsing relationship how do you think uh, you keep talking about external forces coming in how do you think we can rebuild that and bring sark sark back into what it was supposed to be uh miss kanna th thank you i i didn't thank you enough for the generous introduction you gave me and uh, i was not being able to recognize myself in fact when you were telling that uh, but anyway thank you uh, uh, i i also did not respond to your indo bangla relationship i may come to that if you if there is time i have to run to something else as yes. well but but the on on the on the sark resurrection i'm not quite sure that sark as a structure is as it was conceived Uh, in bangladesh in fact uh, uh, is serviceable in the future under the new circumstances it is not only about indo bangla relationship how we will we are going to deal with the youngest member of sark the afghanistan in the mm -hmm. future and which afghanistan to be invited into it is quite unsure we are about that you see and when sark was conceived and initially in fact it was conceived from myanmar to afghanistan Afghanistan was not brought in at that time because of their domestic politics then it was as you know it, it was brought in but then Myanmar was never in and and i just wonder if Myanmar was within sark would it have behaved as they have behaved uh, that's uh, another issue so one of the uh, if you when i look at the cha sark charter and i have written on that separately that uh, one of the issue which we start we thought is good for sark is to avoid bilateral relationship issues so yeah, and we cannot convene a meeting if not all the head of the states have agreed to that so those kind of absolute unanimity is it helpful or not i don't know you know if you look if you if you all go on referring to european union look at european union there is no absolute unanimity with poland and hungary now the, how they are behaving as we all know and so whether that that is one principle one would look into uh, if you look into the african union over there just they have taken the decision on mali guinea burkina faso you will see the issue of that kind of issues are being dealt with not that we are not the first one in the world to deal with this kind of things the so the the second issue which has never been other than unanimity absolute unanimity is the issue of bilateral relationship was considered to be out of the agenda but why won't the country's leaders take advantage of their face to face meetings and have tea on the veranda on the sidelines so you know the uh, i have done my stint uh, accidentally in the diplomatic service uh, and i i can tell you many thing many thing happens not in the room it is on the elsewhere in the veranda or in the corridor and or if over your you know the Uh, in the evening receptions and everything everywhere else that is where usually you cook your policies i am pretty sure mr kamaluddin in his own way has done it and the so why you didn't we put in those kind of sideline discussions as it goes and this is a, a normal practice in g20 and elsewhere and oh. uh, and in united nations so i think sark needs some uh, structural restructuring before it gets to at all revived and up to the speed so uh, who would do that i mean who would you uh, sort of uh, 
how have you, have you, may, may, encourage or may, approach may, or may, push? Sharma, Ms. Sharma, have you given this question to South Block? Not yet. In your country, <laughs> your foreign ministry. Not yet. I would I love to do instead, that. Instead, instead of giving this question to me, I think you should take it to your South Block Mandarins. They would have a better answer than myself. <laughs> right. I'll do that. Yeah. So now, since you have to write somewhere, <laughs> I mean, there, there is there's no point that you start something and because there's one door closed, you don't open the other one. The idea is to keep knocking the doors. I'm sure somebody will open the door. I, I, I am very much with yeah. you. I am very much with you. I'm just telling where the key lies to the door. <laughs> no, no, you are definitely with us. That's why you have come on a platform. We are grateful for that. And, yeah. uh, and there's so many things that I'm even taking notes of everything that you're mentioning because there are so many things that we don't know. Like, you know, just as little as just peace to uh, this thing that we've always... Um, when you spoke about the neglected middle class, you know, people who are young and, you know, possibly overeducated, they don't find employment. I've seen that myself. I've seen like really good people out sitting at home, you know, really trying to see what should they do next. Because that's why we have so much brain drain in the country. Because all of them then have to look for opportunities. Ms. 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 Sharma, before I run away, I wanted to address your Indo-Bangla relationship issue, if you allow me. Yes, a couple yes, of seconds on that. Oh, yeah. see, Indo-Bangladesh relationship is undergoing, uh, I think, a metamorphosis in the sense that uh, I would say that uh, new situation in the relationship is emerging. The most significant three achievements of Indo-Bangla relationship in our 50 years of independence, if you leave aside the uh, historic support which we received from India during the liberation war, uh, and where more than 12,000 Indian soldiers gave their lives, uh, uh, and the India really gave uh, refuge to a million refugees, including myself. So apart from that, we, what, we, what we have seen in the, it has undergone ups and downs, depending upon the regimes which had been in Delhi and Dhaka. Uh, but there had been at least three major significant achievements in our relationship. The first, I think so, is the Ganges Water Treaty. Uh, nice. Ganges Water Treaty it had been as in 1990s, uh, the second half of the 90s, we achieved that one. Number two is the Land Boundary Treaty where all these, uh, you know, Chitmahals that which was la landlocked points which have been exchanged and they redrawn uh, with India. It, was, it, it is a great success of the post 2000. Uh, and the third, we also have made significant progress in not allowing our each other soils for insurgencies directed to other countries on peace and security. I think I would single out these three major achievements in Indo-Bangla relationship in the last 20 years in that way. Water treaty, land boundary treaty, treaty and, 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 and consensus on uh, anti-terrorism activity directed to other countries. So if you see the current uh, relationship as it, uh, as it is there, uh, there is an outstanding agenda which we need to address. It is an, in, in the mind of the Bangladeshis, uh, uh, there is a, a huge, uh, you, know, per, uh, you know, strong perception that what Bangladesh has done for India, India has not adequately reciprocated to its country. So it, it, it concerns that how we have uprooted all the Indian, in, uh, Indian source insurgencies from our country. It has not been reciprocated adequately by other issues in the bilateral relationship. Well, first and foremost is the Tista Water Treaty. So we are not getting enough water through Tista and a bilateral uh, resolution of that problem is not there. We know that how the water issue is also an interstate problem in India. But nonetheless, uh, we have been told that the center wants it, West Bengal Didi doesn't want it. So we have gone through this ping pong quite a lot. But the Tista water treaty is, the, is one of the critical things which has to be resolved. The second issue on the mind of the Bangladeshis vis-a-vis -vis India is the issue of border killing. Uh, we all know during the nights there had been smugglers going around on this and the other side, particularly cattle traders and etc. But that does not necessarily mean we will have to use disproportionate you know, viol uh, means over here. You don't need to. We, we all use taser guns and other things nowadays, smoke bombs, sound grenades. 
Why do you have to fire real bullets, real, you know, live bullets in that way? So joint security, joint patrolling and other things are very much on the line. Indian sides also people die uh, on, on this kind of things. But there, we have opened uh, border huts, five kilometers on both sides to do trade and commerce. But still, the border killing is a very, very emotional issue in Bangladesh on that. So there are outstanding issues. But there are new issues which are coming up. The new issue is that Indo-Bangla relationship is being reshaped, although SARC is not there, but we have BBIN, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, and Nepal, or BIN, Bangladesh, uh, Bhutan, uh, Nepal, and India, because in Nepal, uh, Bhutan somehow opted out from the automobile, regional automobile uh, uh, agreement for sustainable, uh, uh, sustainability issues, uh, pollution issues. Uh, so the future of Bangladesh and India relationship lies in creating a comprehensive economic partnership arrangement agreement, and that will include both connectivity, trade, investment, no, and not only trade in goods, but also trade in services. It should include macroeconomic policy, financial deregulation, digital framework for that, logistics, and many other things. That is the future. That is the future we should be looking into, and these two countries make become the gateway to the new South Asia, which we are imagining. So, as I say, these are all things in making, and possibly uh, I, I would love to enjoy my pension benefits and leave it to the young communities to do those unfinished work. Thank you. Thanks a lot. You've actually sub subbed up everything. I only want to part by asking you to give advice to Furo on what they should do as peace messengers. <laughs> <laughs> you are doing what you are doing. You know, uh, you are doing uh, the dialogue, uh, which is very important. And I come from a center which is called Center for Policy Dialogue. Uh, to end with a historical, uh, you know, anecdote on that. Uh, uh, the founder of our uh, center, Professor Yaman Soban, a, a iconic figure in Bangladesh and a join uh, on the profession and many other things. So he was in Cambridge and his classmates were Manmohan Singh and, and, and Amartoshan. Uh, in fact, Amartoshan and myself, we went to the same school in Dhaka when Amartoshan was here. So uh, St. Gregory's High School in Dhaka. So uh, the uh, Amartoshan in his bi uh, biography, I think it is an argumentative India, uh, mm. Indians, he wrote that my friend, uh, the Bengalis love Adda, that is, uh, you know, public reasoning or, 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 or debating or it's not uh, benign gossiping. Uh, that he, as well. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, they have set up a full center to do an Adda or, a, or discussion or dialogue. It is called Center for Policy Dialogue. You know, <laughs> Amartya has it about our center in his biography, Argumentative Indian. So, you know, Puro is taking forward that tradition of public reasoning with evidence and transparency and participation and inclusivity. I welcome you. I congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks you, sir. A lot. Thank you. Uh, and, and what would be the advice that you, if you had to give an advice to the world leaders and to the leaders of SARC? Pardon? It's what the advice? The advice, yes. No, no, no. I, I think that would be presumptuous on my part to give advice on that. I only can say what we expect. We expect, as I said, you, you have to be respectful to your own citizens to be respectful to others. So the, uh, you have to be more pluralistic, more tolerant to alternative views. It, it, if, if, if it has to be a relationship of trust and it has to be a relationship of mutual respect and mutual respect means that your agenda is no less important than my agenda. If you think your agenda is more important than my agenda, then we are not having a common basis for going forward in, in, at this moment. So I think that is the point. And don't use that external. You should, we should all understand that, that politicians quite use their external relationship for domestic consumption. So we should be able to find out what is for domestic consumption, will it create indigestion or not? So that would uh, right. will have to be throughout. And that's our role as a civil society and as a my, you know, the, 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 those who are involved in civic activism, public reasoning, including the private sector, to point out that every other time. I can only say what we should be doing. I cannot much say about what they should be doing, but they should learn from us as well. Thank you.
Thank you so much. That was a very that was a very polite way of giving us a lot of work to do. <laughs> You've already given me like a couple of things to do here, and I've taken notes. So these are the things to do in next quarter. But I assure you that I will try my best to at least execute most of them, and then see if we can come back to with some results. Say, okay, you know, this is what um, happened. How do we take this forward? Please always be uh, you know as supportive as you are to us today. so we can take this forward